Good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider the news of the day. Let's begin with news with Joe Lowe, the wanted businessman, gave an email interview to Singapore's The Straits Times, which was published today. Now, in that interview, Joe Lowe denied being a mastermind. In fact, he said he was only an introducer and an intermediary. He said he was being made a scapegoat for the 1MDB scandal and would not return to Malaysia as he did not believe he would receive a fair trial. What do you make of that interview? Well, it's fascinating because this is really not news in the sense that, you know, Joe Law, I think, has been quite consistent in uh, portraying himself as an innocent a victim of, you know, uh, domestic politics in Malaysia, so on and so forth. And this is, you know, if he goes back, if you remember that Euro Money interview he gave uh -huh. many years ago. But I think, Melissa, what's interesting about this is really the, the, the circumstances, right? It's why has the Straits Times Singapore given him this platform to say what he wants? The question is also, why didn't they push back on some of his uh, claims? Well, and this is something the Edge does, isn't that's it? That's right. Well, okay, so that, to, that, to that comment that you said about why didn't they push back, now that interview has been uh, commented on. I think the, uh, the co-author co of Billion Dollar Whale, which was about the 1MDB scandal, said that uh, that interview was pointless. The comments made were, uh, I guess, you know, didn't really answer the questions that were asked, and the questions themselves left a lot, uh, left, you know, was lacking in some sense. In fact, the Edge had said, um, had called out the Straits Times, saying that uh, it was nonsensical spin, and uh, he has the. In the comment that they put out, they said, stop the nonsensical, nonsensical spin you're doing with help from your friends at the Singapore Straits Times. Strong words there from okay. The Edge. But this, The Edge and The Straits Times have uh, gone head-to-head -head on many issues around 1MDB and Joe Lowe in particular, uh, also you know, in, in the past. But the, what's interesting about uh, the, the response from The Edge, Melissa, I think, is also some of the claims that they make, right? So mm. one of the things they do is that they debunk uh, Joe Lowe's claims about innocent saying why for instance didn't he fight the Department of Justice's you know um, seizure of his property if he was innocent believing that the US the bastion of uh, you know judicial independence he could have fought a fair trial there now uh, but they do go on to say that in this question of who's the principal and who's the intermediary they believe that in fact uh, the former Prime Minister the alleged former Prime Minister Najib Razak and Jolo worked in cahoots basically they they were both right. uh, principles in this, and not, one was not subordinate to the other. Do you think, Sharad, that media should be calling out other media for not asking the right questions? Well, I, I think so. You know, Melissa, when it's when it's very apparent uh, that you know uh, a media organisation is using itself as a platform to float certain ideas or to provide a, a defence of particular individuals, I think it seems. Uh, it seems to me perfectly reasonable to call them out. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that you know, many uh, newspapers do in fact have links to governments or interest groups and they become the voice for that. So in, with the Straits Times Singapore, of course, the suggestion seems to be that somehow uh, the St Singapore government is, uh, is approved this align mm. when it comes to Joe Law and the 1MDB issue. Well, we also have to think about the question of timing. Why did Joe Law decide to say yes to this email interview now after many years, I believe it's been four years since he has made an appearance in the media with any kind of official uh, interview. So I think those are the questions that we should consider tonight. But, um, let's, yeah. but before we go on, another thing that uh, the Straits Times does allow as, as, as the the Edge puts up, uh, allow Jolo to claim is that he's in the Middle East. Mm. And when they believe, uh, and I don't know what basis they believe this, that he is in fact in China. That's so right. So that's another thing that I think is fascinating. I would urge everybody to read the uh, the Edge response. The to Edge's the rebuttal to saying that they, they wanted to ask Jolo the obvious questions that the Straits Times of Singapore did not ask. All right, let's move on to the poor maintenance of our public transport facilities. Now, Transport Minister Anthony Lok says he he is disappointed with the culture uh, that the culture of better maintenance has not been instilled 
among transport uh, service providers. Now, he was particularly unhappy after a spot check at the Kuala Lumpur KTM station today when he found only one out of four ticketing machines to be functioning. There you go. Well, you know, if you, are like myself, take public transport, Melissa, you know that uh, many things don't necessarily function. I, I, I think, actually, our public transport system and the services are generally quite good. I use it on a regular basis. Um, but uh, there's two things that come to mind. This is, a, this is a, also part of our political culture where a minister does a spot check. Right. Uh, and you can't keep a system running if the minister has to do spot well, checks. What do you think about spot checks? I mean, well, isn't I, that a way to keep everyone on their toes but the actually, boss might come and visit? <laughs> yes, but this is not the boss. This is the boss's boss's... Bo the boss's boss. I mean, it's the <laughs> ultimate, you know, boss. And you can't run a country if the prime minister is the only one that strikes fear in... Uh, you know, in the, the people who run the system mm. and they must have a system of maintenance and checks and balances uh, and informing uh, uh, on what has been, you know, uh, not provided or what is uh, malfunctioned. It cannot be happening because the minister comes there. Right. Nevertheless, it's a wake up call. But like in so many wake up calls, people press snooze. So the <laughs> question is, <laughs> Melissa, you and I included. <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean, Melissa, the problem of maintenance culture Malaysia, mm. is this new? Yeah, no, it's not. But the, the point that the minister is trying to make is that we should be looking to instill a, a culture of better maintenance among our service providers. Now, I'm just wondering, how do we go about doing this? Where does the onus lie? Whose responsibility is it to, provide, to, to maintain, um, uh, I guess, or to provide that better maintenance? Because as users of public transport or public goods, it is also the onus is also on us to make sure that we don't destroy these public goods. I'm, I remember, you know, many uh, there were there were many stories about you know days after MRT stations open or the Lake Gardens opened once again to the public, uh, you'd see public infrastructure being destroyed. Do we deserve to have nice things? Well, I mean, I talk about, I mean, ticketing machines. I mean, I seriously doubt that this is a problem of people either vandalizing public, uh, those machines, because if you actually use the system, you know they're quite solid machines. Right. It would take a pretty hard thumping to destroy <laughs> them. I think the issue here, uh, you know, really has to do with who in the station, what is your hierarchy, just structure in which somebody says, okay, if something is not working, it's then reported, and the question is, the person is reported to, do they act fast enough, ah, right? And, and so on and so forth. I mean, th these are just, you know, systems you put in place. I mean, the fact that a minister has to come down for, you know, everybody to wake up, I think is extraordinary. All right, let's turn our attention now to the bushfires in Australia. Rain has fallen in fire-ravaged parts of Australia and temperatures have dropped. However, officials have warned that temperatures could rise once again to create an even larger mega blaze. Now, Malaysia has offered to help Australia tackle this disaster, but is it going to be enough? Well, you know, Melissa, uh, I think when you see the just this extent of the destruction, uh, you know, you've seen satellite pictures of the burning that's taken from the stratosphere or from satellites. I mean, it, it is, in fact, extraordinary and, and very sad because we're talking about millions and millions of animals lost, right. uh, both, you know, who are part of the commercial uh, agricultural sector and also just wildlife. And the question is whether you know, what are the prospects for regeneration? Right. Uh, because we know that this is not, uh, now we know actually from histories that have been given to us, that this is not the first time it's happened on the continent. Australia, of course, is well known for being a dry continent. It's really the, the question of uh, political responses, uh, systems, again, either working or not working. Right. Well, you know, uh, apparently there's been f a fund that's been put together. So the uh, Prime Minister has uh, said that they were going to use taxpayers' money to spend, uh, to tackle this, I think, 1.4 billion US dollars of taxpayers' money for a national recovery fund. Now, the question is, as we turn our attention to Australia and we look at what's happening there, I know many Malaysians have offered to help or feel very, um, feel that this story resonates with them, that the disaster resonates with them because we know we have links to Australia through family or studies or businesses. Um, but the question is, what can Malaysia learn from this? You know, uh, are we, are we uh, future-proofing ourselves enough in case there are climate-related disasters here on our land? Right. I mean, the other thing that, that's really fascinating is 
uh, and, and saddening in some ways is that this is a country that you know many Malaysians, uh, former Malaysians, called now call their home. Um, Malaysians, many Malaysians, you know, for whatever reason, aspire to move to or work or live or the land you know, of milk and honey, study, isn't uh, it? <laughs> study in Australia. <laughs> But, you know, even affluent countries, democratic countries, countries that seem to in many ways, at least politically, got themselves sorted, can still, uh, you know, be in denial about their responsibilities to the environment and put themselves in such a, a horrendous mess. 650 uh, is the measurement of the air pollution index right. in Canberra, right. which of course is the capital city. I mean, this was something that Sarawak uh, suffered in the, in the worst of the haze. It is choking uh, it is very sad. So you don't look after your environment, you're in for big trouble. That's right. The planet is all we have. Now, after this, folks, we're going to take a closer look at the U.S.-Iran tensions after the Qasim Soleimani killing. Now, stay tuned to consider this.